Perfect. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Wind Power 2014. It is great to have all of you here with us, especially after this very exciting and productive year that we have had. Last year, I stood before you and promised that together we would create a comprehensive, integrated agenda for the industry and for AWEA. And I'm really pleased to report that last summer, last fall, working with many of you, working with our work groups and our committees, we did create that comprehensive agenda to move us forward. And we called that the Wind Energy Agenda. This slide up on the screen is a summary of that agenda. It has up top the goals for the Wind Energy Agenda to double wind energy by 2020 and to get to 20% by 2030 of U.S. electric generation is wind energy. To accomplish those goals, we laid out four pillars of work. We needed to increase the demand for wind energy. We needed to continue cutting the cost for wind energy. We need to address some of the implementation issues, and we needed to continue educating our political leaders. Those four pillars of work rest upon, or are built upon, a strong foundation of your association, AWEA, working effectively with our very important regional partners, with the Wind Energy Foundation, and with the American Wind Wildlife Institute. What I'd like to do this morning is walk through with you the accomplishments of this past year in each of those four pillars, give you a sense of those, and then perhaps even more importantly, talk about the work we need to do going forward. But first, I would like to put all of that work in a context, in a context by sharing a bit of a personal story. My wife and I have three kids, and it was a couple years ago, they were in their early to mid-teens, and we decided to take them out to dinner and put forward this somewhat provocative question. The parents here can relate to this provocativeness of the question. When we asked our kids, what had we done well as parents, and what had we done poorly as parents? My daughter, it was as if she'd been studying to answer this question. She listed off a litany of mistakes that we'd made. She had phenomenal memory. I was impressed. When she finally took a breath and talked about the positive, she recounted a story of a trip that we did, a five-day canoe trip where we paddled across Shoshone Lake. In the first two days, we were battling winds and rain and waves. It was not pretty. The kids had blood blisters on their hands. We got to the other side, took a day rest running around the geyser basin, and then when we started the trip back on the fourth day, the kids were grumpy. This was not a pretty sight. And then the wind came up and we lashed together our canoes and set sail. And the phrase that my daughter used both on that trip and recalled in this dinner story was, that's when I learned the magic of wind. The magic of wind. There is magic in wind. For her, it took blisters and turned them into smiles. For us, day in, day out, we take breezes and we turn that into electricity. There is magic in wind. But making magic is also hard work. I'd like you to hang on to this thought of the magic of wind while I recount the hard work that we ha have done this past year going through the different pillars of work that we've done. And let me start with demand. A key dimension of the demand for wind energy are obviously the state region, uh, renewable portfolio standards. And last year, we were attacked in 20 different states where there was the potential for reducing or weakening or eliminating the regional portfolio standard in 20 states, and we won. We defended the RPS in 20 states. We had a 1,000 <laughs> batting average. And in addition, a couple of states, like Colorado, we strengthened the RPS. This year, we have been attacked. The RPS has been attacked in Kansas, the backyard of a couple of uh, billionaire brothers. We have defended the RPS in Kansas. We're also under attack in Ohio and in the process of defending it. In fact, this past weekend, we had a couple of great editorials as a result of a number of companies and AWEA and some of our consultants going into these papers explaining the great story about wind energy. 
So we are making progress both defending and where we can strengthening the regional renewable portfolio standards to increase the demand for wind energy. That's one place. Second place, we've been working with the Environmental Protection Agency as they get ready to propose in June <coughs> the uh, Clean Air Act 111D provisions to remove or to reduce carbon emissions from existing power plants. It's our hope, our belief that that proposed regulation when finalized next summer needs to be a strong regulation. This country does need to address more aggressively climate change and carbon emissions. But we also hope that EPA, and we're advocating that EPA provide flexibility to states so that each state can figure out how it can best reduce those carbon emissions. And we believe wind energy can be a huge part of that solution. In fact, it can increase demand second only to our current structure of RPSs with the PTC. Huge potential for increasing demand in wind energy through that EPA standard. And it's not surprising that we're doing well with RPSs, we're doing well with EPA, because poll after poll show that Americans love wind energy. Navigant did a poll recently, 72% of the American public said they like wind energy, and that number, 72%, is on the rise. 73% of Americans say they want to see those tax incentives extended for renewable energy. Third, in Kansas, we're close to 20% of the electric generation in Kansas is wind energy. 91% of Kansans support wind energy. So we've got the demand, the call from the American public for more wind energy. So it's not surprising that there are a few other billionaires. Warren Buffett and his Mid-American Energy is demanding and installing more wind energy in the middle part of the country, both for consumers and for companies like Google and their server farms. Other billionaires like Phil Anschutz, who made a lot of money in oil and gas, but is now realizing the right thing to do going forward is to install a thousand turbines on his ranch in Wyoming. And it's not only billionaires that are demanding more wind energy, utilities are as well. This chart showing that there have been in the last year 60 PPA signed throughout the country from utilities demanding more wind energy. The number one utility, XL Energy, I think it's been 10 years in a row, it's been the number one utility for wind generation. They recently announced a plan to add two gigawatts more of wind energy to their system. And when they announced that plan, they said that additional two gigawatts of wind energy would save their consumers a billion dollars over the life of the projects. A billion dollars by installing that additional two gigawatts. I want to segue to a second, for a second to climate change. At the times when it's appropriate for us to talk about climate change, we can say two things. One, wind energy having a profound impact. This chart showing the 100 million tons per year of carbon emissions that are not being emitted from the electric generating sector because of wind energy. But here's the kicker. We have a unique voice, a unique message to also share, and it is we're a leading solution to climate change and we save consumers money in doing it. That's extraordinary. Susan Riley, the chair of our board, will be up tomorrow talking a little bit more about climate change and our role in addressing it. I want to now talk about cost, that second pillar, and what we need to be doing and what we are doing. Through the great work of this industry, you can see in this chart on the left, the increase in productivity of turbines. As we've increased the output of individual turbines, guess what happens? The chart on the right side, those blue bars, show over the last couple of decades a 90% drop in the cost of wind energy in the last four bars. In the last four years, a 43% drop in the last four years. That is an exciting development, continued development for wind energy as we've continued to drop the costs. As a result of that kind of development and evolution of this industry, we've been able to get the word out more and more about how affordable wind energy is. We work with a lot of journalists here, Paul Krugman, an editorial writer, op-ed writer in the New York Times. This is great. He said, and this is part of a longer op-ed that he wrote, I thought of the idea that wind and sun could be major players as hippy-dippy wishful thinking, but I was wrong. But I was wrong. That's great. The reason he was wrong was those previous charts plus 
we've done a good job extending the production tax credit. That is still an important part of the funding for the industry and with the start construction language. Because of that, we now have the largest construction boom ever in the history of this industry, 13,000 megawatts under construction right now in 90 different states, uh, excuse me, 20 different states, 90 different projects. So yeah, we are that good. <laughs> Let me move off of costs and talk for a minute about implementation issues, because we're making significant progress there as well on the implementation front. One of our challenges, obviously, has been wind and wildlife interactions. And I'm pleased to say, with a lot of work from our siting committee, we were able this past year for the Eagle, Eagle Take Permit to extend the length of that permit from a five-year permit to a 30-year permit. We also have been able to make progress in safety and safety training. We uh, completed this year our safety training program that's now available for sale on our website. In addition to that, we've been working more closely and closely and closely with OSHA so that when you're developing your projects or operating your projects, there are fewer and fewer surprises in working with OSHA. And on the transmission front, this past year, we and others in the transmission industry were able to get 10,000 megawatts of new transmission added to the grid, and we've got another 60,000 megawatts in planning, enough to achieve our goal of doubling wind energy. Great progress on the implementation front. On the education front, on educating our political leaders, we subscribe to an approach championed by President Abraham Lincoln back when he was debating Douglas. He said the following, public sentiment is everything. With public sentiment, nothing can fail. Without it, nothing can succeed. Consequently, he who molds public sentiment goes deeper than he who enacts statutes or pronounces decisions. So this past year, we've been working hard with you and many others to mold public sentiment. How have we done that? We've been issuing lots of research papers, white papers, press releases, news releases. We've issued our quarterly reports. We did our annual report all to get the word out and to mold public sentiment. We also have been working with different constituent groups, with farmers and ranchers. And it was great, just by way of example, they used to talk about wind energy as a cash crop. And now, in many parts of the country, they talk about wind energy as a drought-resistant cash crop. It's great that we're molding that public sentiment, but you can't just leave that public sentiment out there. You've got to help the public come to the political leaders, whether in state capitals or in Washington, D.C. And one quick story, we had a meeting a couple of months ago in Senator Roberts' office from Kansas. Siemens was great enough to bring a number of their employees with us into that office. And I sat there as one of the employees, a woman, read a letter about how the production tax credit, the extension of it, meant they had more orders, they were busier, she was able to put in more time, and as a result, she was able to put more food on the table for her family. There was not a dry eye in that office because she was telling a genuine personal story. The professional lobbyists, we just shut up because she was telling a story, and that's what we need to do more of. And we need to be doing that in Republican offices and Democratic offices. One example here of an event about a month ago that we held here in Las Vegas with Republican Governor Brian Sandoval and Democratic Majority Leader Harry Reid. That's the kind of work we can do bringing both sides together as we are molding public sentiment. It has been a great and successful and productive year Give yourselves a round of applause, please, for all of these accomplishments in each of those four pillars. But there is a lot more to do if we are going to double wind energy by 2020 and if we're going to get 20% by 2030. And DOE is going to be unveiling the preliminary results of their wind vision. If we are going to achieve our goals, and if we're going to achieve what DOE unveils, a lot's got to happen, because those goals are not going to be attained unless we create a more stable, sound policy framework at the federal and state levels. 
it is our responsibility to make that progress. We are at a crossroads. We need to get the PTC extended, and we need to create a long-term policy environment, and we need to make progress on each of those four pillars. It is our responsibility to do that. And what I want to do now is talk about how we are going to do that in this room and how the 80,000 employees in the wind industry supply chain have to get involved to make this happen. This next slide shows, is going to show the checklist. This is the checklist that should be in each of your bags. I would ask you to find this checklist. These are things that we are asking you to do that you can do to make sure we advance this industry in creating that stable, strong policy foundation going forward. And here are some examples. I ask all of you to sign up for the powerofwind.org. It's written in here, powerofwind.org, so you're getting our emails on how you can get involved. I also would ask as many of you as possible to sign up for our Speakers Bureau so that you can speak to our Rotary Club or wherever it is that we need to have speakers. I would also ask you to update your member profile so you're getting all the newsletters that you need given your areas of interest. I would ask you to bookmark on your smartphone truthaboutwindpower.com so you can have the latest talking points. And if you're eligible, I ask you to contribute to WINPAC. WINPAC is our political action committee that allows us, it enables us, it empowers us to give financial support to our political champions. It is extraordinarily important that we raise more funding in this election cycle through our WINPAC, and I'd ask you to get involved. One last way I'd ask you to get involved. The extension of the production tax credit is in an extenders package. It was passed out of Senate Finance Committee a couple of weeks ago. It will likely be on the Senate floor next week. So here's the next thing I need you to do. Write down this number, 202-224-3121. When this session is over, please call that number. That is the switchboard to the Capitol. Ask for your senator, and they will patch you through to the senator, one of your senators, and let them know you would like that center to vote for the extenders package so that the PTC is extended. Just give that message to them. Then hang up. Then call the number again and ask to talk to your other senator and leave them the exact same message. In closing, there is magic in wind. My daughter knows it. I know it. I feel it. Meredith McDonald a wind tech who's on the right-hand side in the middle of this photo, in the middle on the right-hand side there, was the one who took that other photo, hopefully you can see it says, I heart wind energy. There is magic in what we do, but there's also hard work in what we do. We need to come together, engage all of us, engage the 80,000 people in our supply chain to make a more stable, stronger policy foundation for this industry. We is this year celebrating our 40th anniversary. Say five years from now, we sure as heck better be back here with a stronger, more stable policy framework. I don't want to be back here in five years without that. So working together, we can make the magic of wind a reality. Thank you very much. It's now my pleasure to introduce two videos, one from a Republican, one from a Democrat, the two senators here in Nevada. So please join me in watching a, a video from Senator Dean Heller and then a video from Senator Harry Reid. Hello, I'm Senator Dean Heller and I regret I'm unable to be with you today for this important conference. I hope the next few days are productive and informative and I hope you have the chance to collaborate and exchange ideas about the future of renewable energy. There's no better place in Las Vegas to host a conference like this one. As you all know, Nevada is ground zero for clean energy leadership, and we have tremendous renewable energy potential. Fact is, energy policy is absolutely critical to America's future. A sound energy policy is key to economic growth, national security, and environmental stewardship. 
Developing alternative sources of energy, like wind energy, will help us harness our vast potential and will make our country stronger and more prosperous. As America becomes more energy independent, utilizes technologies like those showcased this week, we will provide more good jobs, create a higher quality of life, and keep energy prices affordable. Those are important goals that I'm committed to reaching as a United States Senator serving on the Energy and Natural Resource Committee. I want to thank everyone who contributed to planning and coordinating this conference, as well as everyone who supported and participated in it this year. I've appreciated working with each and every one of you and look forward to continuing that relationship as you innovate as leaders in America's energy sector. Thank you for the opportunity to share a few moments with you and enjoy the rest of your time right here in Las Vegas. Welcome to Nevada, everyone. The Wind Energy Association, thank you for doing this conference in Nevada. We are in love with renewable energy, as well we should be. It was only just a short time ago that Tom Kiernan and I met and we talked about the $5 billion industry in Nevada of renewable energy. We have wind in White Pine County, not far from here, that has been spectacular. Near my hometown of Searchlight, we're looking at it. 87 turbines to be put in there to produce lots and lots of electricity. It's the future of our country, renewable energy. We must be part of that future. Thank you for meeting in Nevada for three days to talk about that future. In September, we're going to have my seventh annual Clean Energy Summit. The keynote address will be delivered by Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. We, each one of these summits is better than the last one. I certainly hope you can attend. It would be worth your time. And by the way, have a great conference. Great. We've got a series of great speakers to follow me this morning. Um, a bit of a change, though. Dave Danielson from the Department of Energy was going to speak this morning. The unfortunate news is he's not speaking this morning. The very, very good news is he will be speaking tomorrow. And the reason it's moved one day is he's got a very significant and special announcement to share with all of us, but can't do it until tomorrow. So come back tomorrow morning, and Dave Danielson from DOE will join us then. This morning, we've got Sean McGrath, who will be introduced in a moment, Region 8. EPA Administrator, and also Stacy Custers, who is the Vice President for Renewable Energy and Origination at NV Energy. To introduce Sean as our next speaker, I'm going to ask Chris Brown, the President and CEO of Vestas North America, to come up and make that introduction. Chris serves on the AWEA board and on our exec committee and is a great partner in the industry. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Chris Brown. Fun. Yeah, good. Thank, <laughs> thank all of you, pioneers, past and future. The future of the wind industry is extraordinarily bright, and the future also starts right now. I officially pronounce Wind Power 2014 open. The exhibition hall is open. Our programs will begin now. I want to encourage everybody please attend, get involved with get in a leadership role with our different work groups, our committees, and all the sessions that are ongoing now and into the year. Attend the exhibition hall, and at 4.30, join us for the first exhibition hall happy hour. So again, welcome to Wind Power 2014. Have a great and productive several days. Thank you all very much, and thank these guys. <laughs>